Welcome everyone to Smarter in September, the series that covers timely topics and just things you're curious about. This has been a fantastic series and I can't believe we're on the third segment already. Today's segment is Smarter, Safer Social Media. Um, We've called in a couple of UBT experts and we just can't wait to jump in. My name is Kelly Robert and I am the Journey Program Manager and I'm part of the Marketing Department at UBT. Caitlin Moore, my contemporary and partner in crime on all of these, is the bank's financial literacy manager and I could not put these on without her because she helps with everything Zoom related. Nikki Davison is one of the marketing coordinators and she helps connect all the dots so it really does take a village. Today we we pulled in Brendan Henning who is UBT's digital marketing strategist. And he ensures that the customers of the bank have the best digital experience possible. And we also, the only person not from marketing, but we're trying really hard to make her feel welcome, uh, is Jenna Harris. And Jenna is from the bank's compliance department. And she is a fraud specialist. And I'll let you tell or let her tell more about what she does. But unfortunately, she's kept very busy in her job with all the fraud that's out there. We're going to talk today about just smarter and safer social media, just like it sounds. Um, I'm going to let Brendan just jump in and, and tell you everything he knows. Well, we don't have time for everything he knows, but to hit the highlights. So take it away, Brendan. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Oh, that's a preview. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, can everybody see my screen okay? Jenna, if you give me a nod, I can see you. Okay. Um, so my name's Brendan. Um, Kelly called me a UBT expert, which I'll take the compliment, but I haven't been a UBT expert for long. I've actually been with the company now for a couple of months. Um, So my job at Union Bank is the web strategist and social media falls under my umbrella as well. So if you see something being put out on Union Bank's Facebook or Instagram page after this and it has a typo in it, uh, I am responsible for that. And please let us know, we'll get it taken care of. Um, Before I started at Union Bank, uh, I did come from the world of advertising. Um, So that middle picture there, I um, was the creative director at an advertising agency called Red Thread, um, which I helped start while I was in college and did that for a few years after I I graduated as well. Um, And as creative director, I was in charge of a multitude of things. Uh, My background was in copywriting and social media kind of fell under my umbrella uh, at Red Thread as well. So I had done social media for all sorts of different clients from laundromats to um, United Way was a big one to um, Round the Bin Steakhouse. So uh, a lot of different avenues. Um, And then after I left Red Thread, I did go on a little hiatus. I moved out to Colorado, uh, worked on a farm for a bit, which was fun. Then I was a tour guide. Um, So I just basically took people on road trips all around Colorado and did that with my life. Um, So that's that picture on the right there. Um, Little secret, that's a staged photo. And that's kind of all you need to know about social media is a lot of it is... uh, I don't know if fake's the right word, but definitely putting your right, your best foot forward. Um, but I missed the marketing game and the writing game, so I got sucked back into it, and I'm really happy to be at UBT. Um, today, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is we're just going to give an overview of some of the more popular social media platforms. Um, we're not going to do a deep dive into all of them, um, but just to kind of give you a lay of the land uh, and some maybe that you've heard of from the news or from your kids or grandkids talking. Um, But the big one, the big behemoth is Facebook, of course. So we're going to dive into Facebook. Um, I'm actually going to show you my Facebook um, and what mine looks like and how I use it. Um, And then we're also going to talk about a few common mistakes that uh, we see people making, um, not just to like make your Facebook cool or anything, but like really egregious things like putting out private information on your Facebook. Um, So we'll address some of those as well. 
All right, we'll dive right in. The first social media uh, that I'm going to talk about is called Instagram, which you uh, maybe have heard of. It's definitely one of the more popular ones in the world. Um, this is my preferred social media that I use personally. Um, Instagram is predominantly just pictures. That's how it got started. It was really popular amongst photographers early on, people taking pretty photos and just, it was a place to put them up. Um, it used to be only used on people's mobile phones and then they've changed recently. So now you can use it on a desktop computer, um, but it doesn't look as good and it doesn't work as good on a desktop. So it's predominantly people looking down at their phones, looking down at Instagram. 1.2 billion users around the world as of October in 2020. Um, Instagram is primarily used for things like sports, travel, lifestyle, music, events. I mean, it's really anything can be relevant on Instagram. And recently, they've made a push. Um, Im images are still kind of king on, on Instagram, but they've made a push towards video. And so creators that are putting up videos on Instagram, the algorithm that feeds, that shows you the things that are on the app um, is favoring video. Um, so we at UBT are, are looking for excuses to put out more videos as well, because it just seems like you get more eyeballs on your, on your content with video. Um, now, the reason they've made that push to video is because of TikTok. TikTok. So um, I'm guessing many of you have heard of TikTok, um, both good and bad. Uh, I downloaded TikTok for about two weeks and then deleted it like a week ago. And I haven't told my boss yet, but we'll do that right after this. Um, TikTok is, ex it's just on your mobile phone and it's exclusively video content. The way it works is when you open up the app for the first time, it's just going to feed you random, like anywhere from 10 second to minute long videos. And they can be anything. Um, typically, TikTok, like the, the bread and butter content wise is music, dancing, and there's general entertainment, people trying to be funny. Um, and it's all random. So as you, you just swipe through this video, you watch five seconds of the video, swipe onto the next one, watch one second, swipe to the next one. And TikTok learns about the things that you like and will start to only feed you videos that they think you're going to be interested in. So, um, about 4% of TikTok's users are 65 and up. So I'm guessing many of you do not have firsthand experience with TikTok. Um, one of those users who are 65 and up is Bob Weir, co-founder of The Grateful Dead. He was on TikTok before I was. Uh, and he was actually a big reason why I decided to download it in the first place, but wasn't for me. So I ended up deleting it. Um, and half of their users are, are under 29. So this is very much like the new kid on the block. Um, I think people are still kind of keeping their eye on it because it's definitely a, a major, major, major player uh, around the world at this point. Um, but there, there's been similar social medias like this in the past. Um, if anybody's heard of one called Vine, which was a very similar platform to TikTok, which went under and is no longer in existence. Um, so it doesn't yet have that foundation that the other ones do. Um, I did also want to quickly touch on TikTok in terms of uh, security. You probably have seen in the news that there's some security concerns about TikTok. It's, it's banned in several countries and almost got banned here in America. The issue is a, it's a privacy concern, um, but I wanna rest assure everybody that if your kids or grandkids are on TikTok, they themselves are not in any personal danger as long as they're using the platform smartly. Um, it's more of like a holistic privacy concern about who can see or wh what they're doing with the data that they gather from you. Um, so it's not inherently dangerous in and of itself, if that makes sense. Next is Reddit. Um, other than Instagram, Reddit is my preferred social media. They used to have a slogan called the, uh, the Reddit called themselves the front page of the internet. Um, and that's the best way I've been able to describe it to people. So pretty much there's, there's nothing that happens online on the internet these days that doesn't find its way onto Reddit. Um, the way it's structured is it's a, basically a bunch of online communities. You can kind of think of them as chat rooms. So I'm involved or I'm a part of the 
um, chat rooms, which are called subreddits. Um, so I'm, in, I'm involved with the subreddits for Lincoln, um, Nebraska, uh, Grateful Dead, which I mentioned, Colorado Avalanche. Um, so I see a lot of content specific to those things. Um, in this screenshot here, if you see, there's a um, 36,000, 36.1K 36 over there in the top left. That's the number of people that have upvoted that post. So you can click the up arrow or the down arrow on any given post. And that's basically just saying, yes, I like this or no, I do not like this. Um, and the way Reddit is structured is the more upvotes you get, the more people are going to see your content. Um, so it's somewhat of a popularity contest, but then also you're gonna see content specific to your community. Um, and it's also really good for things like events. So Kelly and I will tune in and we'll watch uh, these streams of Grateful Dead concerts. Um, during every one of those live streams, there is a thread on Reddit where everybody who's watching that same stream is talking and it's several thousand people and there's several thousand comments all just talking about the show. Um, so that's kind of a great way to stay in touch and, and find an online community. Um, some others that you may have heard of that we're not going to dive in too deeply here. Um, Pinterest is a big one. That's basically if you were to take HGTV and make a social media out of it, that's Pinterest. Um, it's also really popular for shopping. Um, so a lot of brands now, are, they have a Pinterest because they're able to put up basically your, uh, your inventory on Pinterest and people can buy it right from there. Um, that's also true of Instagram these days, which I, I should have mentioned. Um, they're starting to do an e-commerce functionality with Instagram as well. Um, that's still not its primary focus. Uh, LinkedIn is used uh, predominantly for business purposes, making connections. That's one that's not used as frequently um, as some of the others. People might log into their LinkedIn once every few weeks or even just when they're looking for a job. Twitter used to be um, a lot more relevant than it is now. It's still getting used quite a bit, um, but it kind of used to be Facebook and Twitter were like the, the one-two punch. Um, Twitter is kind of falling off in relevancy, but it's still very, very popular for things like events, um, politics, news, and sports. Um, so if you're ever watching a sporting event or a concert or something, and you see a hashtag down in the bottom, a pound sign with some words after it, um, they're telling you to, to use Twitter so you can follow that event through that hashtag if you know how to use Twitter. Um, Snapchat is basically just a messaging service. I threw that on there um, because while it seems silly to a lot of us that like it's the way it works is you send a photo to somebody and as soon as they look at that photo after 10 seconds, it disappears forever and it's gone. Um, which doesn't make a lot of sense to most of us because it's, you know, it's, it's like the opposite of email. You get sent an email, it survives forever. You can always go back and reference that email. Uh, for the younger demographic, like kids in high school and younger, Snapchat has surpassed text messaging as their preferred way to communicate with each other. So kids are sitting in school Snapchatting each other rather than texting. Um, and before that, you had them passing notes with the, to each other. Um, and then YouTube, everybody's heard of YouTube. Um, whether or not you've used it directly, you've seen videos um, posted on YouTube. It's basically just a, a video hosting service. Okay, but we are here today to uh, primarily talk about Facebook, um, which is still to this day, the largest social media platform in the world by far. Um, so big that they actually own Instagram. They just straight up bought Instagram a few years ago. Um, 2.74 billion users every month. 63% um, of adults use Facebook um, and seniors happen to be the fastest growing demographic. Um, American seniors, 46% of them are on, are on Facebook. And you can see I put some other numbers there, 38% on YouTube, 15% on Pinterest. Um, so Facebook is not only far and away the largest social media platform, but it is also far and away the largest social media platform for adults and up. That's something that has a little bit to do with uh, Facebook. When So I graduated high school in 2012 and Facebook was just becoming popular like while I was in high school. So it used to be exclusively college students. And then it was college students and young grads and maybe some high schoolers. That's when I jumped on. 
Um, and then the mom started joining. So I, I remember <laughs> it sounds mean, but it was a big thing back then. Uh, for Mother's Day one year, I added my mom on Facebook because she always wanted to have like be my friend on Facebook. And I was like, no, it's like really lame and embarrassing. Uh, and I finally was like, all right, you can see my stuff. But we like we made all these rules about like you can't post on my photos all that often. And anyway, it's uh, because of the the change of demographics. I think it, kids are still using Facebook. It's just one of those things that you kind of it's a necessity almost to navigate through modern life. Um, similar to having an email address, um, but they're not using it nearly as much, um, myself included. I'm kind of exhibit A. So I'm about to show you my Facebook here. Full disclosure, um, several years ago, I was going to delete my Facebook and uh, I decided instead just to deactivate it. So uh, I kept my account, but I haven't really used it in years. However, all that content is still there and I can still show you how to use it. So I will jump over here. Okay. Facebook, let me minimize this. So when you first log on to Facebook, if you, if you don't already have one, um, the first time you go to facebook.com, it's gonna have you register as a new user. It's a very simple process. There's a new notification. Um, but one of the first things you're going to do is to set up your profile. That's what you're looking at here. This is my profile. Um, to get to your profile, simple enough, you just click on your name or your, your picture up here. And this is where all of your information is housed. Um, the first thing I'll say about Facebook is you don't need to know what every single button does. You don't need to know what all of these bells and whistles are. There's things on here I've never touched. It's fine. It's not like flying a plane where you better know what all of the buttons do. It's more similar to, I don't know, using a microwave. There's buttons on my microwave I've never used and that's fine because it does what I need it to do. So you can just learn the parts and bits and pieces of Facebook that are relevant to you that you need. Forget about the rest of it. Um, so like you can see here, it's asking me to add a bio, a bio about myself or add some of the hobbies. I haven't done that. I don't need to. If you'd like to do that and make it a more personalized experience, Go for it. Um, so on my on my profile, what you're what I'm going to see are all of the things that I have posted about, and then also all of the things that my friends have come and written to me. Um, it's basically like a big bulletin board. Or when I was in college, we had a bunch of whiteboards on our dorm floor, and then with markers, so anybody could come by and write on your whiteboard. Very similar to that. So I just had a birthday. People were wishing me happy birthday. Um, my best friends just got married, so they took a bunch of photos and tagged me in them. That's why they're showing up on my profile here. Okay. Now I'm going to go to the homepage. Quick disclosure, this is a live look on Facebook. More often than not, 99% of it is very PG and appropriate, but I don't know what my friends are talking about. I haven't talked to some of these guys in a long time, so who knows what we're about to see, but should all be appropriate. Okay, this is what the home page looks like. Now, um, mine's gonna look a little bit different than yours because I am the manager of a couple of accounts. So I have a few more tools than um, what you guys will see. Um, but this is the lay of the land here. So um, up top, these are what are called stories. Um, Stories are, they're following the model that Instagram and Snapchat kind of pioneered, or I should say Snapchat pioneered and Instagram adopted, and now Facebook is adopting. These are just videos and pictures that are put up for a limited time, usually about 24 hours, and then the, they disappear forever. Um, so here's one of my friends. I used to be a tour guide with this guy. So he's putting up a video of him, uh, looks like Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, I like the Journal Star page, so I see that here. Um, any, any friend that you add, page that you like, group that you join, if they put out any content, if they make a post, if they put up a photo, that's gonna show up here on your home screen, um, which means that you kind of get a uh, you kind of get to cater this home screen to what you'd like. 
um, you're not going to see things that are completely irrelevant to you. Okay. Um, I should mention, so you, you'll see things that your friends put up and then you also might see things that your friends liked. I know it gets a little bit confusing. Um, it's, it's, if you think of it as like networking bubbles, you're going to see all of your, your first connection friends and then maybe also your second connection friends, your friends of friends. Um, so like I don't remember ever liking this Woodstock page. They think it's something that I might be interested in because a bunch of my friends have probably liked this Woodstock page. That's why I'm seeing it here. Um, I want to find an example of perfect right on cue. Okay, so this right here, Lincoln Calling. This is a music festival in Lincoln that was um, just this past weekend. Um, I think they still have some more shows. Um, but you see this little sign there that says sponsored. That tells me that this is a paid ad. Um, so I never liked the Lincoln Calling page. They spent money for this to show up on my Facebook. Um, and they can target you based on your interests, uh, similar interests from how you use your Facebook. So if you like a bunch of pages that have to do with music, Lincoln Calling can say, can you target people in Lincoln, Nebraska that show interest in music? So that ad's gonna get served to me. You will also see ads over here along the right column, right here where it says sponsored. These are both um, advertisements that are just placed here. This is the same Lincoln Calling ad right here. All right. Um, at any point, if you get lost, if you're clicking around, so I'm gonna click on this ad. Sorry, a little slow here. That was a bad example. That opened up a different, uh, different page, sorry. Um, Omaha Press Club. Okay, so now I'm on the Omaha Press Club, uh, which tells me it's a, it's a restaurant. I'm clicking around. Maybe I click once or twice more onto different links, and now I'm completely lost, and I don't know where I am on Facebook. Don't panic. If you ever need to get back to the home screen, you just click on the logo up here in the top left. That'll take you back home. Or you click on your picture or your name. That'll take you to your profile. And then you're good. Um, I also wanted to make a note that don't be afraid to click on things. Nothing's going to break. Um, you're not gonna destroy your computer. Nothing's gonna erupt in a big ball of flames. Um, pretty much everything that you're gonna do on Facebook for the most part is reversible. Um, so I'll do an example right now. I haven't posted anything on my Facebook in like five years, but if I were to make a post and say, hey, Journey, and post it, and then realize, oh, that's a little random. Look, it disappeared. I don't know where it went. Oh, there it is. I was gonna go to my profile because I know that it was gonna show up there since that's something that I posted. Everything I post is gonna show up on my profile. These three dots are what is essentially your options. So if that was a mistake, I click on these three dots, move to trash. It's gone forever, just like that. So, um, and I suppose I did skip over when you are ready to make a post to Facebook, um, which you don't have to make any post to use Facebook, you can just kind of add your friends and watch what everybody else puts up. But if you'd like to contribute as well and, and put up a photo, um, this box right here is where you do that. So click on that, type whatever you want. You can add photos to your post. That's just like adding the photos to your email. Um, you can tag people so you make sure that they see it. Um, you can even click on this little button here and it's kind of like a creator tool, which is kind of cool. And it gives you all these different, uh, yeah, get out of this. It gives you all these different, um, yeah, stop. Anyway, it gives you a bunch, like for Valentine's Day, it'll have like a bunch of different hearts and it makes it look cool. Here we go, there it is makes it look like you're a designer. That's kind of the hack. There's one with a album on it. Okay, a um, couple of other things I wanted to show and then um, we're gonna do questions as well. So if there's something specific that you wanted to see or um, a story that you don't understand what happened, um, we can do those as well. Um, okay, this button here is for pages, leave. Um, don't worry about this because these are for pages that you manage. 
Um, so of course I have the Union Bank pages on here. Um, so yours might be empty, um, but this is a big one here. This button up top that I'm hovering over right now is called groups. Groups are again, very similar to chat rooms. Um, so if you're a part of a group, you can post things directly into that group and only people who are in that group are going to see them. Um, so I'm a part of a group here called Husker Ticket Exchange, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, and so somebody here is trying to get rid of their Iowa tickets, right? Um, a really, really, really cool function of Facebook is if you go to this groups page, you're probably not gonna be a part of any groups just yet. You see here on the right, it says suggested for you, Nebraska motorcycles for sale. That is a bad guess by Facebook. I am not interested in motorcycles, but if I was, I could click on join group and then I'm gonna be a part of that. And when I click on this button here from there on out, I'm gonna see all of the posts into that Nebraska motorcycles for sale group. Um, but if you're looking for groups to join, if you go over here to the left to this discover button, Okay, these are all going to be suggestions that Facebook gives you based on the groups that you're already in. So you can browse through them, Rocky Mountain National Park group. People just talking about Rocky Mountain National Park. I can join that group, gets about 30 posts a day. Um, these are suggestions based on all of the groups that your friends are in. So if you got a couple of friends that are already on Facebook, and they join some groups, those are gonna show up here so you can be a part of the same things that your friends are doing, okay? Um, this works very similarly to events. So um, any brand that has a page on Facebook, including Union Bank, is able to create an event, um, which is simple enough. It just gives you all the details, when, where, who, what, why. Um, and you can, kind of use it as an RSVP system and add it to your calendar. So you can say, I'm interested in going, definitely interested, not gonna go. Uh, same thing as groups, you can use a discover button and it will sh show you all of like the events that are happening in your area that you might wanna go to. Um, so this is another really powerful tool that's kind of exclusive to Facebook, as opposed to the other social media platforms um, that you all might be interested in. Last thing, um, it was hiding behind my name here, so I didn't see it. Um, or two, two quick last things here. Um, these are your notifications. So anytime somebody posts on your wall, makes a comment on one of your photos, um, anything that happens at all that's relevant to you, it's going to alert you and all of those notifications are gonna be housed right here. Um, so I see when people comment and like the Union Bank page. Um, I also wanted to point out this button. This is Facebook Messenger. Um, and it, it's basically like a direct chat with all of your friends who are on Facebook. Um, so these are my friends and family that I have talked with over the years. Um, and it's a, it's a private chat, so I'm not gonna open up any of them, of course. Um, but that's different than posting to somebody's wall. The difference is, uh, whereas posting to somebody's Facebook page to their wall is very, very similar to writing on a whiteboard on the front of their door, whereas sending a direct message with messenger there is akin to writing them a letter that only they are going to see, right? Um, and then last button to show you here is um, this, which is basically just like an all-encompassing menu or options. Again, you don't need to know what all of this stuff does. I haven't, I've never clicked on this gaming video button. I don't know what it does. You don't need to know what they all do. But what you do need to know is if you want to go in here and change your privacy settings, which is something um, Jenna might talk a little bit more about if, if keeping yourself secure. Um, if you want to change any of your privacy settings or block people, that's going to be found in here. Okay. Um, one or two other quick notes, and I will come back to the PowerPoint here. Um, I wanted to make a note about uh, the echo chamber, um, which is a, a phenomenon. So um, the way Facebook works is from the start, Facebook was never meant to be a uh, objective news source on any topic. They were never intended to be like, here's exactly what is what and facts, right? 
Facebook's goal from the start is to keep, keep you using the platform. They make money when you're on Facebook for longer. Um, and the way that they keep you on the platform is to show you things that they think you're going to like. Um, which means that over time, the more you use Facebook, the more Facebook learns about you, the more they cater your experience to only showing you things that you're going to like, which is perfectly fine. It makes it really, really convenient. Um, the danger comes from when it, it's kind of an alternate reality. You have to remind yourself that every, what you're seeing on Facebook is not necessarily how things actually are in the real world, because that is a very, very, very siloed reality that they're serving you. Um, so I say that as a cautionary tale, regardless of what your belief systems are, politics, what your values are. Uh, when people use any social media, including Facebook, um, it tends to get pushed further in that direction. Um, and that's something that we call the echo chamber. Um, so watch out for that. Um, but as a, as a recap here, so first and foremost, use Facebook to follow your interests, keep up on events in your areas, um, add your friends. Um, so you can see what they're up to. Uh, remember, you're not going to break anything, so feel free to just click around. Um, keep it appropriate. It's also maybe not something where, uh, let me try and think of an example here. Oh, like if, if you remember, it's, it's a public forum. So just because you can talk to somebody doesn't mean that every conversation is appropriate. For instance, there's 30 people on this call right now. Um, I wouldn't set up lunch plans just with Kelly in front of the wall because this is not the appropriate forum for that. Um, so I wouldn't post on somebody's Facebook wall and you know ask like, hey, are you down to meet tonight at 7 p.m.? I would maybe shoot them a direct message. Um, but it's okay, mistakes happen. It's, you'll learn how to use it um, through trial and error and practice. Um, and I might also recommend when you first jump onto a new social media, you do what's called lurking which is you don't actually uh, push out any content. You don't load anything or use it. You kind of just watch and see how other people use it before you start going for it yourself. Um, so that would be my advice. Uh, if there are any questions, and Kelly, maybe you want to jump in. I see we have a few in the chat here um, we can address. We can also circle back at the end after Jenna, um, huh. who is going to talk to you a little bit more about scams and how to prevent them and what to do if you do get scammed. Sure. And we do just have, we have a comment and a question, Brenda, and I love your idea of circling back. Sure. Okay, great. Sure. Okay. So let me share my screen here. Okay. So my name's Jenna Harris and I'm a fraud specialist in the financial crimes department at Union Bank. I've been with Union Bank for about six years. Um, what I do on a daily basis, I try to prevent as much fraud as I can, detect it before it takes place. Um, I also help our customers recover when they have been victims of a scam. Um, I also work to educate people on scams so they can hopefully not fall for them, kind of like what I'm doing here today. So what I'm going to do today, um, I'm going to touch base on how to recognize and avoid a scam. I'm going to go over three examples of some scams that we see on a daily basis here at the bank. And then finally, I'm going to go over some steps uh, that would help you recover should you find that you were the victim of a scam. So to begin, we're going to start here with a nice little list, um, four signs that something is a scam. So this is from the Federal Trade Commission. Um, FTC.gov is a great website that has all sorts of information on the most up, uh, most prevalent scams. When a new scam comes out, they post there what's going on, and it's a great place to find a lot of good information. So to begin, um, four signs that something is a scam. Unfortunately, scammers are going to pretend to be from an orga organization that you know. Um, they pose as representatives from charities, businesses such as your bank, PayPal, even utility companies like the Lincoln Electric System. Uh, they also pretend to be government agencies. They may call and claim that you're, they're the Lincoln Police Department, uh, that they're calling from the Social Security Administration or the IRS. Um, unfortunately, they, they take a lot of those businesses' names and try to run with it. Um, they're, when they call, they're going to say that there is a prize or a problem. They're going to pressure you to act quickly. Um, they don't want to give you a lot of time to think about what you're doing or talk to anybody else because they don't want you to realize that you're falling for a scam. Um, 
and they always tell you to pay in a specific way. Um, if you ever find yourself in a situation where somebody you don't really know is asking you to pay in these manners, that's a red flag that you're getting involved in a scam. Uh, the most common way that they ask you to pay is through a gift card. Um, they've also been known to use companies like Western Union, which is companies that transfer money from one person to another. Um, they use applications such as Venmo, Cash App, and Zelle. So those are going to be apps that um, are on your online banking or on your smartphone. It's a way that you can send payments from person to person, kind of uh, through your debit card or through uh, just um, a direct payment, basically. Um, they've also been known to ask people to mail them cash, which um, I think most, most people know mailing cash isn't a good idea. It's not very secure. It's a good way for it to get stolen. Um, they may also ask you to buy money orders or cashier's checks. Um, some general rules, rules of thumb on how to avoid scams. Um, one is very basic. Um, don't answer any phone calls from any numbers that you don't have saved. Um, don't respond to any messages from unknown senders. Um, if, if you don't know the people contacting you, there probably isn't a reason for them to contact you anyway. If you do find yourself talking to these people on the phone or through messages, um, don't give them any of your personal or financial information if it's in response to a request that wasn't expected. So what that means is if you didn't go to the bank in the morning um, to ask them to call you back with more information, and then you're getting a phone call from somebody claiming to be from the bank asking you for your information. That's not something that you were expecting to receive, so you shouldn't give them anything. Um, always resist the pressure to act immediately. Um, scammers, when they get you on the phone or when they get you on a chat, uh, again, they want you to act very quickly. They don't want you to have time to think about what you're doing. Um, they just want you to give them the information they want or send them the money. Um, they don't want you to speak to anybody else who might, you know, recognize that you're falling for a scam. Um, so if anybody's ever pressuring you to just hurry up and do what they're saying, that's probably a scam. Um, recognize how the scammer will tell you to pay. Kind of what we touched base on the last one. They're going to ask you to pay them through gift cards, through Venmo, Cash App, Zelle, things such as that. Um, we always say, you know, when, before you do something, slow down and talk to somebody you trust before you do anything else. If, uh, you know, say you get a call from somebody claiming to be from the police department, um, they're not going to pressure you to ask money right away. They're going to trust that if you need to do some verification before releasing information, they'll give you that time. So, you know, a legitimate organization is never going to rush you or demand payment over the phone. They'll give you time to slow down and talk to someone else before you do anything. Um, so, I feel like the best way to illustrate these scams is just to give you some examples of what we see on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of give you um, bird's eye view of how the scam occurs from start to finish. Um, that's kind of the best way to understand uh, what to look for when you're falling or when you're getting involved with, with speaking to a scammer. So I'm going to start with going over computer tech support scams. So when you're using your laptop or your computer, surfing the internet, logging onto Facebook, um, what can sometimes happen is um, a scammer who is going to pose as a computer repair repairman is going to contact you saying that there's some sort of problem. So they essentially what happens um, you get contacted from these guys. They'll say that they're from an organization that you know. Um, quite often, they're going to say they're from Microsoft or Apple, or they might say that they're from Best Buy's Geek Squad, which is their um, computer repair support team. Um, they'll get in contact with the victim, and they're going to claim that either there's a virus on your computer, or they might say that your Facebook account has been compromised, or someone's able to log into your PayPal and they're sending payments and they need to figure out if that was you or somebody else. They'll have some sort of story with a sense of urgency that your computer or your information is compromised and they're claiming that they're gonna help you resolve the issue. What happens is um, when you're speaking to these people, they may ask you to download software to your computer. So either how they do this, a um, couple different ways. Most common way, these people will get a pop-up to show up on your computer. So if you're surfing the internet, you're Googling something, you get to a certain web page, you're going to get a pop-up that tells you there's some sort of virus on your computer. Um, it's going to have a lot of red text and it might even make some noises trying to get your attention and direct you to call a phone number that's listed in that pop-up. 
Um, in the next slide, I'm going to show you an example of that pop up so you can see better what I'm speaking about. So they'll either get a pop up on your computer or you might even just receive a random phone call from a number you don't know, or you might be in your email inbox and see an email from somebody claiming to be from PayPal trying to secure your account. So once they get in contact with you, whether it be through email or a phone call or they got that pop up on your computer, Next thing they're gonna do is ask you to download a software to your computer so that they can control the computer. They're gonna say that um, they're gonna take control so they can clean up the issue um, manually from or remotely from wherever they are in the world. So once that software is downloaded to your computer, they're able to use your mouse um, to click around. They can see anything that's on your screen. Um, and they can even type messages to you and things like that. So what'll happen once they're tinker, tinkering around in your computer, um, they might open some files, type some things on a Word document, things like that. They're gonna claim, okay, I fixed the issue. And this is where the scam comes in. Once they claim to have fixed the issue, they're gonna request you to pay them for allegedly what they've done. Um, more often than not, this is how they'll ask you to pay. And this is where the scam comes into place. Um, the scammer, they'll say that they're just going to deduct the payment directly from your bank account. And to do that, they just need you to log into your online banking. So they'll have you go to your UBT Go website, log in to where all of your accounts are, and then they're going to say, okay, I'm going to deduct the payment. What they actually do, they throw up a picture on the screen of your computer, and it looks like, whoops, they've actually deposited $10,000. Um, and then they'll say, whoops, that was a mistake. I didn't mean to give you that money. Can you please send it back? Um, what they'll convince the, the victim to do, they believe that there's that extra $10,000 that's in the account. It's not really in there. It's just a picture. Um, they'll have the victim go to the store and purchase gift cards. Um, they might have them go to a Western Union and wire the money somewhere else. That victim believes they're returning money that they accidentally received, but really what they're doing is sending their own money because nothing was ever deposited. So unfortunately, these computer tech support scams happen quite often. Um, it you know usually starts with a pop up. So what we try to recommend to our customers, if anybody's ever telling you that there's an issue with your computer, before you contact those people, just close out of what you're doing. No need to be too frantic about it and just take it to a local repair shop. They'll be able to tell you if there's something wrong or not. And when it's somebody local, it's usually somebody that you can trust a little bit more. Um, so here's an example of a pop-up. And you know, personally, I've gotten these before too, so it's not too uncommon. But what you'll see, um, there's just a lot of red text. There's the scammer's phone number. And here they're saying that they're from Microsoft. Um, they'll urge you to act very quickly. They use some, you know, alarming text saying you need to call us within the next five minutes so you don't lose access to your computer. Um, they claim that they have all this information and they're going to help you protect it, things like that. So if you ever get something like this, best thing, just close out, go to somebody you know, somebody local. Maybe if you have a family member who deals with computers, they can help you out in that situation. Um, another one I want to go over is a spoof telephone number scam. And I wouldn't be surprised if almost everybody we have listening has received a spoof phone number call before. So what a spoof phone number scam is. These scammers, they call out to victims claiming to be from a government agency. Um, often they'll say they're with the police department, they're with the social security office, or they're with the IRS. What these scammers do in these situations, they have these computer softwares um, that allows them to change the caller ID that's going to appear on your phone. So these people may be calling from another country on the side of the world, China, but what shows up on your phone is um, um, a, a, the agency that they want to represent. Um, for example, this phone call looks like it, it's coming from the IRS in Washington, D.C. Um, and I have to laugh as I'm saying this, I'm actually actually getting a phone call from a police department. Um, I don't think it's them, but it really does happen a lot. Once they get a phone, uh, phone number, they'll try to spoof the caller ID and get your attention. So essentially what happens, they spoof the caller ID. It looks like you're getting a call from a legitimate agency. Um, what happens then, they get you on the line and they give you some sort of issue that, that's arisen with your identity and they need you to act quickly. So I have some examples. Um, we've had customers recently uh, receive phone calls from the police department saying that 
their identity is tied up in a crime and they need to clean this up and pay the victim right away or else they're going to go to jail. Um, they've gotten calls from the IRS claiming that the victim owes taxes to the IRS. And again, they need to pay it really quickly or else they're also going to be in legal trouble. Some of our customers get calls from people claiming to be with the Social Security office. Um, they'll say that there's an issue with the, the victim's benefits and they're at risk of losing their monthly Social Security deposits. So essentially, all these scams work the same way. They're going to pose as a government agency. They're going to call the victim and they're either going to try to get the victim's information or they're going to try to get some of their money. So quite often what they're going to ask the victim for is going to be, uh, can you please verify your social security number, your date of birth, maybe your address or your driver's license number. Um, they also may try to say, you know, because of these issues that have arisen, I need you to pay me some money today. I'm going to help you get out of this problem. I just need you to pay X amount. So what these scammers will do, they'll, they'll after they get your personal information, they'll ask you to purchase them gift cards. Um, they might ask you to withdraw cash from the bank and send it to them via the post office, things like that. Um, essentially, just a good rule of thumb. If you're getting any phone calls from these people claiming to be with these agencies, demanding your personal information or demanding any money, the legit agency would not ask for those things. You can almost guarantee it's going to be a scam and you can just hang up on them. If you aren't sure and you think maybe you really are talking to the real agency, what's a good way to verify that? Go ahead and hang up on the call that you're on call that agency back at a good phone number. For example, if you have a call from somebody claiming to be a Lincoln Police Department officer, hang up on that call. You can call them through the phone number you can find on their website or through the phone book and ask, hey, did one of your officers give me a call? They'd be able to verify if that call was real or not. So that's how a spoof telephone number scam works. Um, and then finally, another one that we unfortunately see on a daily basis is a check fraud scam. And I'm going to go over a couple examples of these. So they come in so many forms, but essentially they're all going to work the same way. Somebody that the victim doesn't really know is going to send them a check and ask them to deposit it to their account. They're usually receiving this check for hundreds or even thousands of dollars more than what they expected to receive, um, but they're going to deposit it anyway. And then once the deposit is made, the scammer is going to ask the victim to use that extra money that they accidentally sent to send them back. And they usually give a very good story that's pretty convincing as to why they need to send the money back. So, for example, um, this happens a lot in overpayment scams. So I, I, maybe quite a few of us have listed something for sale on Craigslist or on Facebook Marketplace, maybe, you know, a piece of furniture, um, something like that. What happens? happens in an overpayment scam, you have the victim selling something online and the purchaser who is actually the scammer is going to contact them and say that they're going to purchase that item, but they want to pay with a check. Um, so say I'm selling a chair for $500 on Facebook. Um, my buyer says they're going to send me a check for $500 and then they're going to come get the chair. So I get that check in the mail and surprise, it's actually $2,000. I'm not 500. So now I have a bunch of money. Um, my buyer is going to tell me, go ahead and deposit it anyway. What I'll have you do once you deposit it, can you please just send me the extra money back? I made a mistake and didn't mean to send it to you for that much. Or they might say, I sent $500 for you for the chair, and I'm going to ask you to use that extra $1,500 to pay the movers who are going to come and pick up the chair and bring it to me. So in either scenario, uh, the scammer wants me, the victim, to deposit that check and send that extra money somewhere. And they're going to ask for that money back in gift cards. They might ask me to withdraw it in cash and mail it somewhere. They quite often ask for the victim to send the money through those applications we talked about, like Venmo, Cash App, Zelle, things like that. So if I go ahead and send that money, what can happen? The check that I deposited might actually get returned as a fraudulent check. So when that happens, the bank has to deduct the amount of the check back out of your account because it was no good. And then I'm out any money that I sent to the movers or back to the purchaser. So that's how that scam takes place. Um, in a lottery scam, essentially it works the same way, but the story is just a little bit different. Um, the victim would get a phone call in that case from somebody claiming that they won the lottery. Um, but before you can collect that prize, they're going to ask you to pay a fee. So what happens in that situation, again, they mail you the check, might be for a couple thousand dollars. 
They ask the victim to deposit it and then use that money to pay the fees. And then they're going to send you the prize afterwards. So again, if that check is deposited, the victim sends the money to somebody else to pay for those fees, whether it be through gift cards, cash, apps like Venmo, Cash App. As soon as that money is gone, it's gone. And then if the bank gets notified the check is fraudulent and they have to take the money back, the victim's out that money. So again, essentially it works the same way. The story is just a little different. And then finally, we see, um, you know, a handful of relationship or romance scams. We see these um, originate quite often on Facebook or Twitter or things like that. Basically, any social media where you can communicate with somebody through message, this is kind of where that takes place. And it starts by a stranger reaching out and making a friendship with somebody. So um, quite often, the stranger will just send a random friend request. The victim will accept it, even though it's nobody they've ever met before. Quite often, these people live in another country. Um, what they'll do, they'll just talk on a daily basis, sometimes for months, sometimes for years, and build a lot of trust and really have a friendship. But then eventually what happens is that stranger that's now your friend, or sometimes it'll even be the victim's boyfriend or girlfriend, will send checks um, to the victim. And they'll ask the victim to deposit those with a couple different excuses. They might say that they're having problems with their bank account. They can't make the deposit and they need the victim to deposit it and send the money back. They might tell the victim that, you know, I just want to help you out because you've been such a good friend to me. Whatever the story is, the victim will deposit that check. And as soon as that deposit's made, what almost always happens is the scammer will then say, oh man, I just had a family member get hospitalized, or I just had a bunch of unexpected bills come up and now I'm really needing that money back. Can you please send it to me ASAP? And then the victim, you know, having built a lot of trust with this person, talk to them for months or for years, trust that the check's a good check. And, you know, I want to help you. I'll send that money back. Lo and behold, if that money gets sent back to the scammer, whether through gift cards, cash app, Venmo, all those ways we've been talking about, once that money is sent, it's sent. And unfortunately, what happens quite often is that check gets returned as fraudulent. And then that money has to be taken out of the victim's accounts. So that victim's just out that money. So essentially, all these check fraud scams, they work the same way. Victim receives a large check, not really expecting it. Um, it's usually for a lot more money. Um, and then they're being asked to send money back in those ways that are red flags for a scammer. Um, <clears throat> so if ever you were to find yourself the victim of one of these scams, um, there's a lot of organizations that can help you. All hope isn't lost. Um, your bank is going to try to get your money back as quickly as possible. And we're going to give you the best recommendations to protect everything that might be compromised and to protect yourself going forward. So if ever you or a friend find yourself in one of these scenarios that we discussed, we'd recommend notifying your bank right away. That way your bank can secure all of your accounts and your information, make sure nothing more happens than what's already happened. If you're in a situation where you gave out your social security number or your date of birth, any of your personal information, um, it'd be a great idea to notify the credit bureaus. So what happens there? They place a fraud alert on your credit file, which basically means somebody were to go to a bank trying to apply for a loan or a credit card using your identity, that bank's going to take extra steps to verify they have the real you in front of them before approving that. So it kind of prevents scammers from being able to use your information to open up loans, credit cards, and charge those things up. Um, if you've had any affected computer equipment, um, infected computer equipment from like a tech support scam, what we kind of touched base on earlier. We recommend taking that to a local computer repair professional and having them clean it out. Um, we always recommend going somewhere local when you can meet the person. It's somebody that you can trust is going to clean up your computer and not download more viruses. Um, so that's always really important to do that. And then finally, probably most importantly, is going to be reporting scams to local law enforcement. So we always recommend if, if someone's a victim of a scam, contact the local police department. They're going to take the report from you. If any money was sent, they can most often trace where it went. Um, and a couple other agencies that are really good at helping victims of scams would be the Nebraska Attorney General's office. Um, again, they can walk you through if any money was sent your identity was stolen, give you a lot of good ways to recover from that. 
The Federal Trade Commission also does a lot of work on scams. If you report scams to them, they may not always be able to help you specifically, but what they can do, if you can explain the scenario of how you were scammed, they can take your information and share it with other people. And it can kind of help educate other people on what scams are out there so they can protect themselves before it's too late. And then finally, um, another agency that's pretty good at tracking down these scams is going to be the FBI. So whether you're just, you know, somebody living here in Nebraska or you're a big business that's a victim of a scam, the FBI will take all that information on their website called the IC3. Um, any scam that takes place on the Internet, they want to know about it. They have a website dedicated to taking that information. Um, again, if you've sent money, they can try to track where it went. Um, and again, they just track those scam trends, try to find bigger scam groups and, you know, track them down. So um, essentially, that's going to be the steps that you're going to want to take if you have fallen victim to a scam. Basically, in summary, best way to protect yourself is just to not get involved in the first place. So, you know, good rule of thumb, don't give your personal information out to any unexpected calls or messages. Um, guard that information. Usually nobody needs to know it except for you. Um, remember that no reputable agency is going to call you and ask you for your personal information. They're never going to demand that you pay them on the spot. Um, another good thing to remember, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Um, if you get any phone calls from anybody just wanting to pay you or saying that you won a lottery, um, you know, <laughs> things aren't that easy, unfortunately. So um, we always recommend if you find yourself in one of those positions before doing anything else, before paying these people or giving out your information, slow down, talk to maybe a family member, a friend you can always call your local branch or call us in the fraud department at Union Bank. And we can walk you through the situation, help you figure out if you're, you know, this thing's legit, or maybe if you're the victim of a scam and try to help you from there. So um, that's, that's all I have for my fraud piece. I don't know if there were any questions. We had just a few in the, in the chat feature. And I will just jump in and I will let Jenna or Brendan, whichever is, is applicable to you, or if you both want to answer, that's great. The first one is a comment. And Beth, who had to just leave, said that she was on TikTok and instantly had followers. She never posted anything and it creeped her out. So that sounds about par for the course, yes. Yes, yes. Um and Ellen had a Facebook question. She wanted to know how to unlike something. Uh, if it's a post, it's, it, well, anywhere, it's the same button that you click to like it will turn into the unlike button after you like something. So if you can go find the thing that you want to unlike, right where it says liked, click that and it'll turn to unlike. Great, thank you. Um, Actually, Brendan did answer this one in the chat feature, but for those that maybe didn't see it in the chat feature, Mary wanted to know if there were any thoughts on Facebook posts that ask for, pe excuse me, pictures of pets, ask questions like what was your first car, etc. that she didn't do this, but it, seemed, it seems to always get that type of request or post even though she hadn't responded to those, I think is what she was saying. Um, are they looking for personal information to use for hacking or is it just random? Brenda, do you just want to quickly share the, the great answer that you gave her? Yeah, so she's asking, people will make a post that goes viral and it'll just say like, hey, everybody put the name of the childhood street that you lived on and people think it's fun and to contribute. Um, but you know, when you're signing up for a new website or something where it has you enter in your security questions and answers, very often the question that they're asking is one of those security questions. So now you're just giving them the answer to that. So that might be the last piece of information they needed to, uh, to hack into you. Um, and it can either be that or they're just looking for keywords to try and guess your, your password. So um, if you see those things come along and it, and it creeps you out a little bit or you think it's a little bit fishy, just let it go and don't, don't participate. Perfect. Thanks. Teresa um, asked if she sold something on Marketplace and received a check or money order. How does she determine if it's valid? And how long does it take? 
Yeah. So yes, if you receive a check for something that you're selling online before depositing, what would be best is if you go to the bank and bring that check, let them know why you received the check and that you have concerns that it may be fraudulent. What we can do is try to contact that other bank that that check is from and verify if it's a legitimate check before it's even deposited. Um, Otherwise, if you know you deposit the check and you're planning on waiting to see if it clears before doing anything, I would wait at least seven days um, because it can take that long sometimes for us to get notified if it's being paid through or not. So um, you can ask the teller straight away and we can try to verify it beforehand. Or if you deposit, I would give it at least seven business days. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Brenda? Or, and Jenna, you may want to tag team this one, or I, I'm not certain. Can you share safest Facebook practices? And should I always set everything to private? Um, it's that the safest practice is, yeah, if you, if you set everything to private. Um, if you do go into those privacy settings, you'll see that there's kind of a plethora of options. So you can make it public. So anybody can Google Brendan's Facebook and then see all of my, my uh, content that I've put out. You can set it so only people that you've added as friends can see your content. Um, you can set it so everybody, all of your friends can see your content except for a few people that you specify if you wanna be mean or cautious. Um, or you can say like, I'm gonna put out this, this stuff and like, I only want them, these 10 people to see it because I trust them. Um, so you can really cater your Facebook experience and your privacy settings to whatever you feel comfortable with, um, but err on the side of being overly cautious, unless any of us are trying to become influencers, making a living off of using social media, which I don't think is the case. So it's okay to not get as much traction on your, uh, on your posts, you know. Perfect. Thank you. Jenna, did you have anything to add to that? I would echo what Brent, Brendan said. I would say keep it as secure and keep your settings as private as you would need it to be. So if you're not needing to share it with people you've never met before, I would just keep it within your friend group. Great, thank you. Did I am watching the chat feature. I don't see any other questions. Last chance. Okay. Well, we've had two phenomenal presenters today. And I thank you both, Brenda and Jenna. Excuse me, Brendan and Jenna. I thank you both so much. And thank you, folks, for giving up part of your Tuesday afternoon to join us. You know, we have, we can always get questions. If there's something else you'd like to ask Brendan or Jenna, we can certainly get those questions to them if you'd like to forward those to us. This segment will be recorded and you can see it on the Journey webpage, ubt.com forward slash journey. It'll also be on the UBT YouTube channel. Next week is our very final segment. It's Smarter Estate Planning with UBT's own Leslie Gibbons and Doug Koenig. And we can't wait. So bring your estate planning questions. And in the meantime, everyone be well, be safe, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.